um, folk who might be logging in slightly late, one more minute, so we'll start um, start in, the, in a few seconds. So thanks for your patience. are still ticking. We'll start. That we are recording the session today, um, so it'll be available on the NHS Futures Forum um, after the recording for other colleagues. Um, because there's quite a lot of people on the call, it's probably best to reserve questions for the chat box. Um, I will be keeping an eye on those as well as Sophie um, from NHSEI as well. Um, so I think we'd best just um, crack on so that we can use the time to best effect. Okay. So just a really brief overview, I will talk in general terms about the, the model that we've developed, um, then colleagues will go through uh, the interactive tool, um, how you use it, um, how you potentially may develop it as well, and kind of have a little bit of a um, session about kind of working in the open, which is fairly new to us. That's open in, in several ways in terms of open source, in terms of um, making our work accessible to, to a wider community. Um, and then there'll be time at the end for a Q&A. If, if that does run over slightly towards um, three o'clock after the allotted schedule time, that's fine, but we do need to finish before three o'clock. OK, just for those people who may not know who the strategy unit are, um, very briefly, we were a unit established about seven or eight years ago um, as part of the Lansley reforms, um, coming out of an old strategic health authority in the West Midlands. Um, we're a multidisciplinary team who do quantitative analysis and research um, evaluation. We also do qualitative research. We do evidence reviews. We do um, transformation programmes and sort of organisational development as well. Um, the reason why we're here, I suppose, in this in this space is because we were part of a, a national response to COVID, a longer term response as challenged by um, Simon Stevens office and the Prime Minister's office. So along with colleagues at the King's Fund, um, Health Foundation, Nuffield Trust, Imperial College partners, we decided to sort of address the longer term questions that related to the pandemic and sort of mental health and the impacts of the, the, the COVID-19 infections on, on sort of mental health services. One of those questions which we um, adopted at the strategy unit. Um, clearly, there are strong evidence coming out in, in terms of um, anecdote, in terms of surveys, in terms of people simply looking at the populations and how they were responding to the pandemic, that the psychological effects were going to be um, quite severe, um, harsh, perhaps quite quite long standing as well. Um, so clearly there was a need to try and understand what that may look like in the future. Um, we chose to address this um, problem using a system dynamic simulation. Um, this is a common common tool well used for things like um, epidemic and pandemic um, modelling in terms of the, the epidemic curve. Um, Kim Warren, one of the, the um, sort of most well-known proponents of the approach has worked with us as well on um, sort of the RTT, the waiting list uh, and around plan care. Um, so it's kind of well used within this space and increasingly becoming a common tool that analysts use to try and predict what may or may not happen under a particular set of circumstances. Um, we work quite closely initially, or very closely initially, actually, with um, colleagues at Merseycare NHS Foundation Trust, one of the largest community and mental health trusts in the country. They were sort of asking us at the same time as the whole um, the collaboration project started, really, to, to try and help them to understand it. So it was a really useful way of sort of getting into a provider at a time to understand the operational issues and the, and the things which might potentially impact on, on any kind of model we, we developed with them and then applied later to a national population. Um, obviously, all of our code, if you haven't seen it and everything is available via our website, there's the link on the screen there, which takes you to our publications page. Loads of other good stuff on the website, I should add as well. Um, but from there, you can go directly to our, our app that we're going to talk you through today, as well as the, the code which underpins it, which is all based on, on GitHub and openly accessible. So just a couple of head results in terms of the national model, so plugging in the national populations into our, into our model. Uh, the, the kind of bottom line, I suppose, is about 1.8 
million additional referrals or demand, if you want to call it like that, um, over the next three years. Um, that's just for, for acute mental health services. In addition to that, we know that people will be using primary care services such as their GP and practice nurses to um, perhaps try and understand what, what symptoms and the psychological effects are, are happening to them. Um, other people may use existing telephony and other um, sort of emergency access points across health and care as well. We can't account for all of those within our model, but there are. Um, th this is a tip of an iceberg, I guess. Um, so uh, fundamentally about 11 percent talking about the Okay. Um, how that pans out in terms of teams, um, or I suppose service points within mental health, so primary mental health care, so IAP services are a typical example of that, primary mm -hmm. care mental health teams um, seem to ha have the largest absolute increase in demand, so almost a million odd referrals across mm -hmm. the country, we think. Um, crisis services also may potentially see large increases. That's things like um, crisis resolution, home treatment, 24-7, um, crisis cafes, that kind of service. So we see early, early, I suppose, indications that people may be struggling to manage, cope with, with the additional anxieties or stress that they're experiencing. And then we go down and down. I won't go into the detail. That's all on the website and in our briefing paper as well. Um, we made some quite naughty attempts to um, to translate that into a cost implication for the for the health service as part of the spending review. So literally taking a assuming everything that might present as a result of COVID is the same kind of case mix as as we've seen historically. We think that, you know, might be whatever percent of the, of the national mental health budget. So that, that equates to around four billion. We then spoke to a much more intelligent folk than us at the Health Foundation um, and started to finesse that approach a little bit bearing in mind that a lot of the conditions that present are likely to be kind of the early stage or the more common common disorder types, anxiety, stresses, rather than more severe psychosis and severe enduring mental illnesses. So, so we've, we've changed actually Health Foundation published their, their full analysis on, on, around the spending review across the whole branch of um, health and care services, including mental health um, on Tuesday. So well worth the read as well, if you can go onto their website and, and find that. That includes some of our modeling figures incorporated. So our model, I suppose in a nutshell, is, is a really simplistic representation of what, what may happen on a whole population level. So essentially taking some at-risk populations or any population, I guess, who might experience a direct or indirect um, impact of the COVID infection um, and kind of plot through what we think may happen in terms of the presentation. So using evidence that, that might suggest certain populations experience anxiety or stress or distress, PTSD, et cetera, in, in various circumstances. Um, and then sort of mapping those symptoms presentations again to the types of services which they would ultimately present in. So, so we went through quite an intensive design process with Merseycare to set up our initial um, model up in the northwest, um, which was a really useful process. I, I would sort of encourage anyone who's engaging with the model to try and do that work across, you know, public health teams to understand the population numbers that feed into these, as well as understanding the provider perspective. Um, so it's all really useful to start to establish a relationship and a picture really of, of your system. So whilst analysts just want to get hold of the numbers and start playing with, with and things, it's a really useful. ...which the evidence tested we look at. Um, so essentially we counted all of those up from, from a variety of different sources, tried to adjust for potential double counting. Obviously, we know there's comorbidities mixed in there. There's potential crossovers in some of our populations, even though we tried to segment them. It's not completely possible, given it's all from differing data sources. Um, so in theory, the, the model covers the entire um, resident, if you like, population of, of England, or when you start to reflect your own local circumstances, you can put whatever population figures in that you may need to. Um, so just thinking about, I suppose, the design, how it fits in with, with patient pathways, you might sort of experience this kind of effect. So using the example of someone who's newly unemployed um, might experience depression. So we feed in a distribution of impacts. So this is what we think essentially might happen in terms of the, the effects of the pandemic over a three year period. Um, so as a default within the model, we've assumed a kind of a fluctuating distribution of impacts with kind of sort of um, large peaks, I suppose, um, of, of the pandemic in terms of um, caseness, in terms of ICU usage and, and so on, 
um, but but kind of diminishing over time as hey, we get better at managing the whole situation and people become more resilient potentially. So that's just one idea that we had to feed in, sort of work through with Health Foundation colleagues again, but other people again may have different ideas and there is flexibility in the model to, to choose how you want to distribute those, those impacts. The scale of the impact is essentially determined by the evidence that we've um, that we found. Um, and then we mapped those through to the various services. Again, that was done um, largely with colleagues in Mersey Care and using um, sort of other advisors to, to guide us in terms of that. Um, so what are those flows? What percentage of depression may end up in IAPT in um, general psychiatric treatment, et cetera, et cetera? So again, those are percentage values. And some of those people will obviously who don't go into a service potentially go back into the, uh, the at-risk population. That's part of the SD approach, essentially. Off people go into that Required to get and kind of what do people tend to spend within a particular service line once they get there again so our model keeps those in that bucket if you like for that sort of determined period of time so they're generating demand throughout their their period of contact with mental health services um, once they've completed their treatment i suppose what what, what is the su success again people who might not need additional support and those that do potentially go back again into the at-risk population who might have potential secondary effects of the condition and overlaying activity as well. So typical clinical contacts, I suppose, for a particular service, which might start to help us to plan in terms of the demand. I won't dwell too long on the limitations. I know we're tight on time. Again, these are all uh, listed in our, in our briefing report on the website, but there are things to consider if you're going to interpret the model or try and develop it, I suppose, and understand how it might relate to real life, whether you might need to make sort of post modeling adjustments for, for your own sort of local set of circumstances and um, beliefs around what's going to happen, etc. OK. Um, in terms of technically how we developed it, um, I Tom and, and possibly Victor as well will talk in more detail about this. Um, essentially, we developed the whole mathemat mathematical model within um, the R coding framework using the differential um, equation solve package, so D solve package. Um, as I said at the start, we made all the code freely available so anyone can go on, download it um, and use and adapt it. Um, and in terms of the interactive tool, which we'll walk you through in just a second, that's developed, um, implemented in Shiny, um, hosted on the Shiny apps website. Again, the link's there. That's freely and open to use for anyone as well, um, NHS or otherwise. Uh, we, we appreciate this might have applicability um, far, far and outside of um, formal healthcare services. So the things that a Mersey Care have been using since we've done the initial modeling with them and other things which through conversations we think might be useful to use the model for. So obviously capacity and workforce planning, do we need additional people or capacity in services to handle this potential surge? Um, do we need additional monies? Um, do, we, you know, do we have to bid for that from certain resources and so on? Um, is the way we currently deliver services um, going to work in the future given that we might have more demand? Um, perhaps if our pathways are appearing very complex, should we perhaps address the way that they, they work? Contract negotiation, um, get into the financial nuts and bolts again, I suppose. Um, and thinking more broadly about mental health promotion strategies. So thinking about those populations who may fit into the, um, the non-treatable or the, the non-success in terms of the, tr the treatment viability though. So people who might float within the system because they're not a threshold but might need some additional support in certain settings and different population groups. So all those things potentially are uses of the model. Um, there's a few of us on the call, but there's loads of others who've contributed, um, both in the unit, up at Mersey Care and the Health Foundation colleagues as well. So there's they're just a few of the names. There's probably some I've, I've missed off there, but um, it, it has been a, a truly um, team effort from, from a load of different organisations. So really grateful to all, all those folk for, for their efforts. Um, so onto the interactive tool, and I think I'm going to hand over to Tom, who's going to share his screen or attempt to share his screen. Um, working off a hotspot, so it might not work, but we'll play by ear. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's just pray that the internet gods are with us today and this all works. Um, so, yeah, as we, we sort of mentioned, the, the code is hosted on GitHub. You can um, go and download this in our studio and play with it yourself if you're familiar with R. Um, I'll come back to our actual application in a bit. I'll, in the, the chat, I've also shared a kind of a documentation page. So I haven't done the best job of documenting the code, but you can kind of go through this and have a look at what the function in the code is interested in. 
something that's provided by our studio called ChinyApps.io. Um, and at the moment, we're sitting on the free tier, um, and that's been working OK for us. Um, this is a great platform if you've got something like our application where there is no real sensitive data. It's um, this is all really high level aggregate data. Um, so there's no issue in where we're hosting this. So if you have something similar, then this is a really great platform to use. Obviously, if you, you're dealing with um, any kind of sensitive data or anything that's um, you've got to handle with in line with GDPR or similar to kind of um, frameworks, then you will not be able to use this platform. But it's definitely great for the kind of freeness. But the application itself, I can just reload, is hosted um, at this address. Um, oh, excuse me while I double click on the wrong thing. Um, but when you land there, it has a, an initial kind of introductory page just outlining what the application does. And it allows you to select from some default set of parameters. Um, we have England modeled as a whole. We have the, the Mersey Care model that we initially developed. We have um, Cheshire and Rural Partners um, have a model generated. And then this option for custom where you can go and create your own model. I'll come back to that one later. But for now, I'll just run through the England parameters. So once you've set your default parameters, you can click onto the parameters tab itself. This is um, quite a busy screen, but you can kind of work from left to right. First, you'll pick one of your population groups that you're interested in. So you can see all the different ones like children, young people, general population. And as you change these, the rest of the UI should update itself to pick the kind of particular conditions that population may suffer from and where the services um, flow to. Um, the kind of susceptibility of that population is so this is just a way of kind of modeling that even though we have some kind of um, 10 million people modeled in this general population only a small fraction of those are actually going to be suffering from the conditions uh, the final part we've got is just this kind of scenario so this is just about how those kind of um you know the people in that population will eventually start to suffer from the conditions over time so you can choose different kind of um scenarios as to how many people are going to start suffering from conditions over time. Within the um, impacts on the population subgroup section, you can see we've got these different conditions listed. And at the very bottom, a, a no mental health needs group. As we um, start dragging some of these slides about, you should update those groups as appropriate. And if you say everyone is in anxiety, then it will set everything to the kind of zero percent. Then within each of the different conditions that are listed here, you can see those listed in the drop down. We're then just mapping where those people that suffer from that condition would go to for um, treatment. So you can see most of the people here go to way up to about 39% of them. Finally, we've got some variables about the kind of services themselves. So we can go in and pick, say, I apt. And then each of these variables then controls how the people that, in that group are kind of treated and um, whatnot. So you first got how many of those people that would be referred to that group actually require um, treatment within that service. And then for those people that are in that service, how long do they typically stay in there? So here we're saying that 50% of the people will still be in service after two months. So that just works out an exponential decay. Um, this next parameter, um, potential patients recovering, so that's to say how many people would no longer be suffering from any mental health conditions after they've for from further mental health issues. The um, final part here is just um, on average, how many contacts in a month does a person that who's going through YAPT have? 
um, I'll come back to the download current parameters later on when I run through about um, uploading custom parameter files. Um, the next type we've got is demands, and this is just saying um, how much um, demands there is going to be over the coming three years for each individual service. So this is um, based off of kind of historical data. That's just to give us a representation of what the what percentage kind of increase there is going to be to a service. And under the results tab, we get the results of all those parameters. Um, so each time we go through and update parameters, it will rerun the model and update these figures. You can go through and select which service line you're interested in looking at. So we can look at IAPT. And this is telling us that the brief summary of over the entire three year period, we're going to have about 2 million people um, are going to be referred into have IAPT over the kind of tra traditional expected um, demand. You can see here over the time what the population groups that are generating that surgeon referrals are. And then we have various charts showing where the referral, you know, how many referrals are created each month, how many of those are needing treatment, the kind of model demands in services. So that's back to that kind of um, contact multiplier that we saw before. And then this chart is showing uh, what kind of uh, amount of activity is going to be um, based on the model demands, which in this case is the blue line down here. Uh, the suppressed activity that was from the kind of first lockdown activity that was missed out um, because services had to stop um, or not accept new patients. We've got the, the underlying, which is this grey line here, which is the, the normal kind of amount. For kind of got at the bottom a, a, a graph showing the kind of um, flows from each of the different population groups to services and you know which conditions they're landing in. So this is just giving a rough overview of where people are flowing from and into. The final three tabs on this um, are just some slightly um, more summarised outputs of over the entire three year period based on like the population group, which conditions they're suffering, and the services that they're landing in. So just a very high level summary those tabs are. Back on the results page, you do have the option to go and download a, a PDF version of this report. So you can either look at for an individual service or all services. So if you want to just download that to have a printed out copy, just hit the download button there, that will get all the results for you. Or if you're interested in using the results of this model in your own local um, reporting solution like Power BI or SSRS, Tableau, et cetera, you can download the results of the model in a CSV file and import that and use as you like. So if we we're interested in creating a custom set of parameters, we can either just start off with uh, you know, one of these base sets here, like England or America, and we can just go through and update all the parameters to be suitable for our own needs. But if you want to create custom sets of um, groups, you can go through, select custom, and it'll take you to this link here. You can press that, and this will just download an Excel file for you. If you open that up, it's quite a complicated set of files, but each of the different tabs here defines the kind of different parts that you were seeing in the, the web application. So start off with these groups, and you could go and rename these groups, add additional lines. Um, you then have to set like a default curve. Um, so that just needs to be one of these ones that's listed here. You need, to, you need to just kind of copy and paste the exact value because it matters on the capitalization. The next is the, the grouped condition mapping. So you would map 
for each group what conditions they can go to. So again, the capitalization does matter. You need to kind of copy the, the names of the groups from the previous sheet and use those down there. List them there. And you need to set a base percentage that um, these kind of people here in this group these different conditions. we've got conditions to treatments so you'll see again that children and young people and anxiety is listed as long with the depression the neurological symptom disorder so each one of these needs to be listed at least once and you need to list which treatments they go to and then the split is just an indicative number of when we add up all of those people in that group there and anxiety what number would go to that so if we have these they're adding here to 100 so we get three percent five percent these don't need to add to any particular number it's, it's just the, the indicative split that it's going to in that case we then have um, the treatments tab so we would list each of the different treatments that we're seeing here and back on this previous tab these treatments here need to match something here but we list those different variables that we discussed previously the kind of treatment success how many months to typically stay in service and what percentage of them drop out at any given point what percentage of demand they're generating and then um, the treatment percent how many of those people go through to treatment if they're referred to them the final tab here we've got the demand and again, we just need to make sure that each of the, the kind of treatments on the previous sheet are listed once. And for each of the kind of um, 36 months that we're modeling, you should have a row of data for them. But once you've kind of populated that file, you can go back, click browse and just find that file that you've just edited. Upload that and it will have set your parameters for you. And that is basically it. Um, you can also go through and change these variables and download that current set of parameters. So if you work on some set of assumptions, you can download those and re-upload them in the future. And that's pretty much it for the model. Um, the only thing I kind of wanted to touch on is the code is all up there available for you to kind of go and play with. And we try to make it so we've put this all in the open so anybody can learn from our own work and derive their own version of the model, make their own kind of tweaks and changes to the app, and use it for their um, own needs. So we're really glad to um, you know, receive any comments or questions about how to use this in their own, your own environment. But that is pretty much it. So. I'll hand over back to Andy to finish off. Sorry, needed to unmute myself. Thanks, thanks for that, Tom. Um, so there's obviously lots of questions been popping up, um, which we'll try and address in a second. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd so. Um, obviously, people are now starting to use the tool and starting to to work with those parameter files. Um, so, a few people have listed. So, the, the common questions that we get asked, we'll try and post a response to those as well and, and put that on GitHub as well, so that people can look or or, or onto our website or whatever. Um, and and any additional tools we think are are helpful so so working sort of i suppose i was an end user as, as tom and, and, and our colleague victor as well kind of developed the um the, the interactive dashboard kind of i used that to try and um, update with different models that we were generating up in the northwest so i was i was an end user as such so came a cropper of, of quite a few different problems that happened with the upload tom's covered quite a few of them there as well it's a lot about consistency of, of 
sort of naming conventions and service names and, and so on as well, making sure you've got the same time period. So I've just alluded to to half a dozen of the, I think, what are the most common pitfalls if you if you get thrown an error message when you try and upload a custom parameter set, then it's most likely one of these. But, but as I've said, we will we'll try and develop this list and um, and then add kind of what, what the solution is to, to that as well and put that on, on GitHub or our, or our website. Um, so I think, again, yeah, Tom, Tom's already probably covered that. So that leaves us, I think, a good um, 10, 15 minutes to have a Q&A session. So I started to make a note, Sophie, but I don't know if you want to read them off and we'll try and address those questions in order that they came in. Is that OK? Sure, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it's really great and great to see the detail um, so that it can be shared, like like you said, and used, used, used elsewhere. I just thought it'd be good to mention that obviously we said at the start, but people that have joined afterwards might have missed, but the session's being recorded and I'll pop the link in the chat again um, so that if anyone wants to go back and see the slides as well and, and watch the recording, they'll be able to. Um, and also we've had a couple of other mini huddles on um, system dynamics modeling. So if it's kind of new to you, they might be useful as well. So I'll pop the links to those in as well. So our first question was from um, Raj and it's, are the treatment types based upon national standard definitions, i.e. the data dictionary or mental health, health services data set? Yeah, hi Raj, yes, um, they do exactly that, yeah. So for the national model, given that we don't have contacts in every provider and every provider has a different suite of services and service names, we pragmatically decided to use the MHSDS service team types. So we looked at all the referrals into those service team types um, and, and that is how we categorise them within the model and how we mapped through the different conditions to those services using, as I've said, Mer Mersey Care staff and other advisors we had on the project. Hopefully that answers the question. Fab, thank you. Um, so Wendy's asked, I assume there is a set of default parameters for each population group and service type built, in, built into the model. Is there a way of going back easily to the default if you want to reset after manipulating the parameters to assess impact of the results? So I think the easiest way of Based one, open the results and have a look at that. Um, open up another version of the tab and start playing with the parameters and flick backwards and forwards between the tabs. That's probably the easiest way of um, seeing the differences. Um, you can then, um, as I kind of alluded to at the end, download the parameters that you've created. So you could then use that as your um, base version, like upload the custom set of parameters open up in a new tab and then go back and start tweaking the parameters again. So hopefully that answers your question. There isn't, a, there isn't like a built in way of directly comparing result sets. Maybe that's uh, something for a future project we could build in. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, and then in addition to this, so um, Emma's asked, can you run the model for local population against national assumptions? I guess if you can't compare, that's not something you can do at this stage. Um, I suppose in a sense that's the easiest manipulation of the the, um, the tool is really you just overwrite the, the population bases with all of your local populations and then that will sort of carry through all of the national default assumptions on all of all of the other services and flows. So that is the simplest thing I can do and that, that would then give you the share of the national model effectively. Cool, thank you, Andy. Um, and then Raj has asked, this, the surge demand is very much referrals based, but is there any demand modelling for longevity for inpatient services? The, the sort of it. So um, we've built in, um, we, we've tried to keep this as a very simplistic model, partly because we we needed to develop this as rapidly as possible. And um, the assumptions we made were at a sufficiently kind of broad level to be easy enough for us to develop and work with um, without spending you know months and months building a, a very complex model. Um, so what we take the referrals that are generated each month and have that kind of um, decay parameter to say 
some patients will spend you know three months in a service um some will take you know six months and then we also have that demand multiplier so you could say that a um, an inpatient takes 30 you know 30 days on, on average you can't say that the, an inpatient would take more than 30 days in a month of bed usage but we set that kind of parameter to say this is how much activity they would be using in any given month and that would give you an idea of the kind of a, a very high level usage there isn't any kind of complexity in the, the model to say like um some patients will use x amount of service others would use you know, twice that much but you could go through and define different treatment types and say you know you've got iapt low intensity iapt high intensity for instance and build it that way brilliant thanks tom um adam has asked do you account for any potential future increases in cases or severity due to suppression of service services during lockdown or restriction periods uh, the short answer to that one, Adam, is no at the moment. Um, but clearly, because you can sort of over type update population treatment points, so for taken as as time goes on and, and new figures are released on benefit claimants, people in unemployment, etc., you can start to add add those into your model um, to then get a recalibrated set of outputs. Um, so that's one one way of doing that. Um, I suppose again the the ability to flex the distribution, so you can put in. Um, I think this possibly answers one of the later questions as well, but you, you can change those distributions um, and have kind of custom ones that map out how you think or as a system, as a population, you think the effects might distribute over time that will also change the way those curves curves work within the model. Um, so that's probably two of the easiest ways to, to get to do that, I think. Thanks, Andy. Um, Charlotte has asked, um, she'd be really interested in interested to know how the data has been used and what actions have been taken locally as a result of having the data. I, I don't know if there's a Mersey Care rep on the call at the moment, but I'll, so I can give you a little bit of insight. Obviously, once we've finished the modelling work with Mersey Care, they've obviously go and kind of embedded it within their operational procedures that we've kind of lost touch with it to some degree. Um, but they've essentially taken the outputs of our initial modelling, they've put them into their own BI system to start to monitor how the actual referrals are keeping up with what our model suggests may or may not happen. Um, and I think then they're going to tweak their kind of expectations based on um, whether that's above or below the curves, if you like, of our, of our model. Um, but they've used them in terms of discussing a few of the things which I put in bullet points before the demonstration, really talking about how they might start to plan sort of their future capacity, both in terms of you know, service capacity, um, service space, um, service staff, et cetera, and the kind of models that they obviously use to deliver those services. If more people are coming in, they might have to start to wait um, more services or offer more digital appointments, that kind of thing. So I, you know, I can't answer on behalf of Mersey Care in terms of the output, but they're the kind of things which they've started to, to use the information for. It's really about local, local planning. Um, they've also, because they asked us to, to look at Cheshire and Wirral and North West Boroughs, another provider up in, in Cheshire and Merseyside, which kind of gives the whole um, STP view. I think that's uh, another question from someone I saw as well. So effectively now we've got the whole population of, of that particular STP ICS area and the three main providers. Of course, there's other little um, private providers and other providers across the border who may take some of those patients, but essentially it's a whole system view now. So they can start to plan as a system you know, at a high level um, where those things are and look at perhaps about shifting resource around. So where one population or provider potentially has a has a surge which outstrips their capacity by a certain amount, perhaps look at um, my actually happened as a result directly. But I, I can probably put you in touch, Charlotte, with someone at Mersey Care if you wanted to to discuss that in more detail. So if you contact um, either Sophie or myself after the session, I can sort of give you a contact to be Mersey Care. I'm sure we'll be happy to talk through how they've started to use the data from the model. Thanks, Andy. Andy's here. Do you want me to? Oh, yeah, please, please <laughs> go ahead. You do a much better job of it than I. <laughs> so it's exactly as Andy said uh, we, when we when we originally did this. One thing we the, the system dynamics aspect of this model was really powerful because it shows you um, 
some of the failure demands in the system in our in our services just historically the way we've been commissioned um and one of the things the division did when we kind of mapped out the population groups to conditions and conditions to services it was so it was so complex that you would think to yourself and, and the division said this um i wonder how a service user <laughs> flows through this service because it's so complicated um, and it's got us to rethink around how would we, if, if you're going to redesign something in, in right now, would you change it now more towards a population approach versus a conditions approach? Because it was centered around conditions. So this has really been powerful in terms of some of that discussion. And the division is now currently working on a number of uh, areas uh, with the couple of conditions of how they redesign services, what investment they need to go into to start to meet that demand. And we are doing surveillance with with, with BI internally using a combination of this work and, and, and some of the work data we're getting from primary care just to understand that. But yeah, if you, if you uh, reach out to us, we're happy to, to talk through uh, that work in more detail. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks, Wes, for um, for chipping in. Um, Alison has has asked another uh, a question, so which was, how did you get or create the underlying values? Are they based on uh, MerseyCare, the national data sets, or, or something else? Yeah, hi, Alison. Um, I think we've partly answered that in terms of where the data comes from for the. Mm. Well, so it's it's all of the MHSDS activity. We have access to the national data sets on that. Um, via the NCDR service. Um, so locally, you may or may not have that. You might have to go via CSU, CCG colleagues or NHS England um, colleagues perhaps to, to get those. But yeah, so essentially the underlying values, um, we pragmatically just used the historic 12 months referrals up to the point of the, the main pandemic. So um, March 19 through to February 20 um, was the sort of pre-pandemic period, if you like. Um, so in a very sophisticated way, we just looped for three periods. Locally, about doing better um, predictions or your, your own predictions. And you can, again, as Tom demonstrated, there are different ways of updating those values within the model. So you can get a much more localized, uh, better sense of where the trajectory was going, as well as the, the surges which our, our model suggests might be coming into the system. I think just to add as well, um, there's a, a further question down about the, the evidence review as well, because there's the kind of two um, aspects as well, three aspects. There's the, the values that come from the evidence review, there's the um, the values that come through from the data sets and there are some values that were generated via um, the discussions that we had with Mersey Care and later on with the Health Foundation. Um, in the um, link that I just shared down below it does kind of go into a bit more detail probably not um, as great detail as we, we could manage maybe, maybe we'll go back and update that page um, when we've got a spare five minutes but um, yeah there, there are the kind of three areas that we got data from there. Brilliant, thanks, Ray. Um, Zoe has asked, uh, do the scenarios on parameters affect the population you've selected or an assumed percentage, for example, sudden shock or prolonged pan pandemic? Uh, hi, Zoe. Um, so the, the, um, the scenarios say essentially that um, over the entire, we, we take that population of like, say, 10 million and we reduce it by some percentage that so like that 10 percent so we we end with one million people let's say in the general population the curve then says like over the the 36 months what percentage of those people that we we say are going to be suffering from a condition wh when are they going to land so it the curve adds up to one in total um 100 percent um so that's how kind of models them through if that makes sense, does that answer your question? Sorry, Tom, could you just say that last bit again? You broke up for me. I don't know whether that was uh, me or. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's almost certainly me just because, uh, you know, I'm having a tough spot. <laughs> um, but, no yeah, the, the, the curve adds up to 100%, each of the curves do. And it, it, it it's kind of states what that model population, where, the, you know, which month they will enter the, the model at. Cool, th thank you. Um, Alice has asked, uh, I'm curious about the level of uncertainty around the outputs of the model. Has any analysis been done into how sensitive the predictions are to various assumptions and parameters? Yeah, hi Alice. Um, 
Again, the short answer is, is no. Um, I guess we hit capacity issues on the plan to do so. Well, aside from the quality of evidence, I suppose it's the fact that we use within our model some of the really early stuff because we were designing this in the early stages of the pandemic, so the March through to June. So we kind of cut off our evidence trawl then, but we know that much better data is emerging, much more robust um, kind of assessments of what's happening um, for the kind of psychiatric morbidity of the population. So, so I suppose that that's an area of the model which, you know, again, if we had endless capacity, we would probably readdress and I would encourage people to kind of keep abreast of that evidence to try and feed that in. Um, so a lot of the uncertainty in the model is about is around those, um, those kind of point estimates and, and whether or not there's confidence intervals around them. So again, clearly you could you could plug in a low case scenario using point uh, sort of the lower confidence intervals around point estimates. That's something that can be done relatively easily. Not built in, unfortunately, at the moment, but but it, it's something that you could do. Um, similarly for a, a high scenario, I, I suppose um, the thing to do really is, like I said earlier, it's about discussing with with colleagues about um, how you feel, how you sense the pandemic may may affect, and, and sort of put your own uncertainties around, and just scenario test, start playing with values, put put things that, which may be conservative or maybe quite aggressive, and, and really just kind of have a play yourself and compare what what you think the model is is, is doing or might might do under a different set of circumstances. So I'd, I'd encourage to have those conversations and and really just get on and play with the model really. Great, th thanks, Andy. Um, Tina said in the in the chat that this had all clashed with another um, mental health services data set webinar. So, so sorry about that, Tina. But we've recorded the session, and I'll pop the link if if you missed the start. You should be able to to watch it back. Um, and she's asked a question saying, "Are you confident with the service team type coding?" Million dollar question. Um, probably no. <laughs> on a national level, um, it's probably okay on average. Uh, but what is going to happen is there's going to be a lot of variability. Um, obviously, some some areas won't submit anything under service team type codes because they've decided locally to, to code it against something else. So again, you'll really have to take um, pragmatic decisions locally about how you how you populate the model with with both those parameters. You you, you can I mean I think initially so we used um, sort of PAS extracts from Merseycare to set a lot of their variables because their local systems are much richer and up to date and easier to, to interrogate because their BI and their analysts know exactly what's in there rather than being forced through the sort of MHSDS churning machine. So um, so on a national aggregate level, they're probably OK. But yes, as, as you start to adapt this locally, you probably want to revisit um, particularly how your services are configured and the flows from the different conditions to them. Some will completely disappear because your services won't won't be offered in that same way or be given different names. So. Um, so yeah, it's going to be really variable, but, but yeah, take a local view, I suggest, on how you want your services to be constructed within the model. Great, thanks, Andy. Um, was there anything you wanted to, to add to the evidence base question, Tom? I see that you've already written a response and you've mentioned it already. Just wanted to give you an opportunity if you wanted to add. No, I think... Um Hopefully that evidence re review page will kind of sufficiently answer the question. I think it it, mm. it was something that we we um, probably should have done at the very beginning of the the, the, the development process. Write that as a, a page. Um, we've kind of kept it in slides and um, in, in various haphazard ways. So we've tried to kind of pull it together as a last minute thing while rounding up the model. Um, so if there's any questions that kind of come out from that link um, that you don't feel are sufficiently answered. Um, our email addresses are best about in various places. I'll stick um, mine in the chat in a second just so you can contact me directly. Cool. Thanks, Tom. I think that's um, all of the questions. There's a, a prompt in there for me to put the link in the chat. I will. I'm just not I'm not very good at multitasking. So I will I will um, once we've um, wrapped up the session. Um, but yeah, just to say thanks so much, Andy and, and Tom. And if anyone has any questions or follow up, I'll put my email in the, the chat as well and, and those links. And um, thank you everyone for, for coming along. I, I hope you found it a useful session today. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Cheers.